This need to manage emerging mega risks is as important as ever. Because alongside major technological, demographic, and political shifts, our very world is changing with profound implications for insurers, for financial stability, and for the economy. And I'm going to focus on those risks, as John referenced. I'm going to focus on those risks um, from climate change this evening. Now, there's always room for scientific disagreement about climate change, just like any other scientific issue. But I've found that insurers are amongst the most determined advocates for tackling it sooner rather than later. And it's little wonder, while others debate the theory, you deal with the reality. Since the 1980s, the number of weather-related loss events has tripled. And, and on an inflation-adjusted, as you would expect from a central banker, as an on an inflation-adjusted uh, basis, insurance losses from these events have increased from around $10 billion per year. Uh, during the 1980s to around 50 billion annually over the past decade. But the challenges currently posed by climate change pale in significance compared with what might come. And the far-sighted amongst you, and we know this from a survey we've just done, the far-sighted amongst you are anticipating broader global impacts on property migration, political stability, as well as food and water security. So the question is, why isn't more being done today to address it? Well, the classic problem in environmental economics is the tragedy of the commons. And the solution to that lies in property rights and supply management. But climate change is a tragedy of the horizon. And we don't need an army of actuaries, even though we do have an army of actuaries in the PRA under Andrew's leadership. We don't need an army of actuaries to tell us that the catastrophic impacts of climate change will be felt beyond the traditional horizons of most actors. It will impose costs on future generations that the current one has little direct incentive to fix. In other words, future costs beyond the business cycle, beyond the political cycle, and certainly beyond as well the horizons of technocratic authorities like central banks who are bound by their mandates. After all, the policy horizon for monetary policy extends out two to three years. And for financial stability, you can, it's a bit longer, but at its extreme, it's out to a decade, which is the extreme of the uh, credit cycle. In other words, once climate change becomes a defining issue for financial stability, it may already be too late. So let me, let me conclude. Our societies face a series of profound social challenges, political challenges, economic challenges, and John uh, detailed them. They also face environmental challenges which link back to each of those. The combination of the weight of scientific evidence and the dynamics of the financial system suggest that in the fullness of time, climate change will threaten financial resilience and longer term prosperity. While there's still time to act, the window is finite and is closing. Others will need to learn from Lloyd's example in combining data, technology, and expert judgment to measure and manage these risks. The December meetings in Paris will work towards plans to curb carbon emissions and encourage the funding of new technologies, but we'll need markets to work alongside them in order to maximize their impact. With better information as the foundation, we can build that virtuous circle of better understanding of tomorrow's risks, better pricing for investors, better decision making by policymakers, and a smoother transition to a low carbon economy. By managing what gets measured, we can break this tragedy of the horizons. Thank you very much. Thank you, John.